the blower and the canister filter hang from the ceiling. This is a one and a half horsepower blower. That's the minimum I would recommend. This filter is made by Wynn Environmental. It has a MERV 15 dust rating, which is very good. And it has a large surface area, which allows the air to flow through freely. This dust pan is made from a gamma lid. So it's easy to put on and off for cleaning. I found that arranging these stationary power tools in the shape of an island made the best use of the floor space and allows long pieces to be moved through the machines. I've located the island slightly off center of the shop so that there's a bigger space on one side for projects and a smaller space on the other side just to walk around. The cyclone is bolted to this 35 gallon dust drum. The floor space dedicated to dust collection is small, it's just this barrel and it's located between the rails of the table saw, which is kind of an unused space. The cyclone draws air in through this hose, and that hose from the cyclone goes to this manifold box that is underneath the cutoff table of the table saw. The manifold box has six IVAC blast gates. Three of them go to hoses on the top, and three of them go to hoses on the bottom that go through the floor. Very short hoses can go from the manifold to the tools because they're all located in this tight island. So there's no ducts across the floor to trip over and no ducts across the ceiling that would get in the way when you're moving lumber around and no ducts along the walls that would use up wall space. Each tool requires a sensor on the power cord and I've located those sensors out of the way hidden actually into the electrical wiring that goes to each outlet. And those sensors send a signal to the IVAC blast gate telling which one to open to direct the airflow to the appropriate machine. So they're all hidden as well. All the wires that go from floor to ceiling are bundled together. A level sensor down here on the drum activates this flashing light when the bin is getting near full. The blower is mounted on one side of this bracket that's bolted to the ceiling. There's an outlet here which goes directly to the fuse panel power bar that plugs into that outlet. The power bar has the supplies to the tool sensors that I showed you earlier. It also has a power supply for the level sensor. Then it has a cord that goes to that box underneath the bench with all the six IVAC blast gates because they need power. And then it has power that goes to this IVAC switch. And the IVAC switch gets the signals from the tool sensors that tell it to turn on the blower through this contactor, which is just a big relay. So it activates the relay, and when the contactor is activated, power flows through it to the blower. The measured air velocity in the ducts to these machines is 4,000 feet per minute, and the measured air velocity in the ducts that go through the floor to the faraway machines is 3,600, which is a little low, but works fine. And when these four inch ducts that are far away from the island are dropped down to two and a half inch for smaller machines, then the velocity in those two and a half inch hoses increases to 5,400 feet per minute, which is great. I've let the filter get quite dirty, so the uh, pressure meter is pinning on full scale, and I'll see how much cleaning up with the air hose I need to bring it back to around the middle. That did not take much to bring it down to less than half scale pressure. I measure air velocity with this anemometer made by Testo. I measure the dust level in the air with this uh, particle counter made by Dylos. And the first number here is the important one. It's the number of particles that are larger than 0.5 micron. So it's a thousand right now. According to Dylos, these readings are what to expect for air quality that is good, bad, and ugly. And I found that first thing in the morning, before turning on any tools, the Dylos reads about 800, like it is right now. And when I run a machine like the table saw without the dust collection system, the reading can shoot pretty quickly up to 20,000, so really high. And with the dust collection, using a table saw or another tool, the dust level only goes up 4,000, so that's an improvement, but still too high. 
The air cleaner is a Powermatic 1250 and they claim to trap particles as small as 0.1 micron by some kind of electrostatic and I found it pulled the dust count down to 700 in about 20 minutes and that was starting from a dust count of 20,000 and if I let it run for a couple hours it'll pull the dust count down below 100 and so I just leave this running continuously when I'm in the shop. So these two tools give me objective measurements that tell me when I'm moving in the right direction and making actual improvements. When the power is cut off, the unit stops, of course, and the only way it will restart is if you push the start button or you use the remote. You can't simply reapply power and have it restart. Therefore, it will not work with an automatic dust collection system because the automatic system wants to start it up by applying power. So what I will do is take some careful photographs of the guts in here so that it can be put back together in the future if I want to and then rewire it so that it's driven entirely by the power. Everything came away nice and easy thanks to the stab connectors except for this little red push button and there they've soldered the wires on so I'll just warm them up with the soldering iron and pull them out. Okay here's the brilliant solution. Green wire from the power supply cord goes to the grounding screw as it always did. The hot wire from the power cord goes to the circuit breaker and then I had to create a jumper to go from the circuit breaker to the switch. Then the other side of the switch goes to the motor. The white wire from the power cord goes to the switch and the other side of that goes to the other lead to the motor. So we've got the switch circuit breaker. These other switches I left in place so there wouldn't be holes. I put nuts on the other side of the screws so there wouldn't be holes there either. Here's my bracket to support the blower and it'll mount onto these four. It's secured to the ceiling with six of these uh, six inch lag screws, three here and three on the other side. They go right into the ceiling studs and when I take into account the thickness of this plate the thickness of this piece here, the drywall, I get about three and a half inches into the stud, which is probably good. And I drilled a one quarter inch pilot hole so that I don't split the stud. Securing this board to the top plate, I've got three eighths inch bolts running through, all the way through and then tightened up here. So that makes it very secure. The blower was supplied with these quarter inch thick rubber things that dampen the vibration to the whole structure and so make it run a little quieter. I mounted the bracket on these spacer strips because I had to clear the track lighting but it's actually a, a good thing as well because if I'm running any additional wiring I've got a space I can slip it through. I used jam nuts with the nylon inserts because I don't want to tighten the nuts down really tight because I've got the rubber damper in there but I also don't want them to come loose. I've got some triangle brackets that are glued and screwed in here so that this piece doesn't swing and it's quite quite secure. You can see that hardly moves. Here's my uh, velocity measuring instrument. It's a nominal four inch diameter duct. I stick this velocity meter in here like so and I can go to different depths in the duct and then I read out the velocity on smartphone. A good velocity is 4,000 feet per minute. That keeps ducts clean and that's regardless of the size of the duct. And 4,000 feet per minute in a four inch duct works out to 350 cubic feet per minute, which is what uh, most table saws and tools like that recommend. And when I measure here, I'm gonna get a higher number in the center of the duct than I get at the edges, just cause of the way the air flows. Uh, but for the purposes of um, comparative readings, I'm just gonna take the reading always from the same position at the center where the edge of the pipe hits this little bump. So I'm getting 7,100 feet per minute and that is with no filter, with no other ducting. So I'm only going to go downhill from there as I add more parts to the system. Another interesting number just for comparison is the velocity right in the center of this six inch port and I'm getting 4,700 feet per minute. When I add the filter I'll be able to see how much that drops. And now I've got to build a box here, which will receive this port and support the filter that'll come down here. So what we got here is a deck tight silicone flange boot that goes on the roof when you have to have a vent pipe go through a metal roof. And that makes a perfect fit. This is a size number three. It goes up to a maximum diameter of a five inch pipe. 
and that's a really you know snug fit on there it's very elasticy and all you do is cut off at the five inch point the part you don't need and that has a nice flange that I can screw on to a plywood box that will support the filter and give some flexibility from vibration things like that so that the vibration of the blower doesn't transfer into the plywood and make a louder noise than it needs to. It was hard for me to design this box on paper so I made cardboard prototypes until I got something that I thought would work. Here's the box that will hold the filter and also connect the filter to the blower. So the exit air from the blower will come in here through there and then down into the filter. The filter has a rubber gasket here and that gasket is higher than the surface that would bolt to this box. So I made these spacers which will allow the metal part of the filter to bear down on there and just compress the gasket by an appropriate amount like an eighth of an inch. And these spacers I'll just screw them on I won't glue them because if I ever have to replace this filter the next one might be a little different and then I would just I would adjust the spacers. On the surface here I spread a very thin layer of uh, silicone caulking using a you know plaster spreader and I don't think that's necessary at all but I just thought it would give a better seal to the gasket. I did the same thing on this part which is where the roofing boot will seal onto and a little trick if you're finding the uh, silicone is sticking to the spatula and you can't spread it is to st stick the spatula spreader into soapy water and then you can smooth it out quite nicely. So here's the lid attached this whole thing's upside down right now and these brackets will be screwed to the ceiling and then I can hook the box into the bracket and then slide the box along to line up this with the boot on the blower and that's a lot easier than trying to hold this big box up at the ceiling get it all aligned correctly and screw it in. I can mount the bracket in the right position hook the box on mount the other bracket and then slide it into position and these are the um, fasteners that will hold the filter in place. I've got them epoxied from the other side so that they don't spin around. I got the box secured with one of these strips on each side holding that lip on the lid and I slid the box left and right to get this red um, roofing boot centered and I had pre-drilled the holes around the rim of the boot and the manufacturer of the boot recommends one and a half inch spacing. The last three screws here are really awkward I can't even get in with a right angle drill so I'm going to drill the pilot holes by hand, which is laborious. But I need the pilot holes because I tried putting the screws in directly into a scrap of this Baltic birch without a pilot hole in it. It doesn't go, go very nice. It pulls up a lot of material, which is not going to get a good seal on the gasket. Okay, it looks really nice, but let's see how much airflow we've lost. Good news is I'm getting the same feet per minute as I was getting before the box was installed. That's 4700. I was concerned that that wooden box is forcing the air to make three 90 degree turns if you look at it and that that 90 degree turns are not a good thing in airflow and I was concerned that that was going to impede the velocity but I think what's helping me is that that box has a much greater cross-sectional area at any point than the five inch duct. This is called a gamma seal lid and the idea is it snaps onto a standard bucket but it's two pieces so you can just unscrew the lid instead of having to pry off the, uh, the other part and it's used for animal feed and stuff like that and it creates an airtight seal. So what I'm going to do here is cut out the center of the top part of the lid, secure it on the filter airtight and then I can just screw the bucket off and on to clear out the sawdust. Cutting down the bucket to make it shallower. Okay, a couple of tips on making this uh, that I discovered the hard way is put the lid on before you put the bottom on because it takes so much force to get that lid down that this bottom like twists a bit and then it'll break the glue joint. The other thing is this is HDPE, high density polyethylene, and it's very hard to stick to it. So a little bit of internet research and it seems like epoxy is the preferred choice. And I rough this up with sandpaper to get a better grip. And then I'll clean the surface with methyl hydrate before I apply the glue. The bottom piece that I made, I've got the same taper as the bucket so that when I stick it in, which I now have to do from the bottom because the lid is on, on an angle, set it there, it'll go down and it'll, it'll stay set there. 
This is marine epoxy, which has a long uh, two-hour set time. I'm just rotating this a little to spread the epoxy out to get a good seal. This is the half of the gamma lid that will attach to the filter, and a clamp will go on four points. And that clamp needs to grab onto the lip there. So I'm going to drill a hole, not in the center here, but offset to the edge in each of those spots. Those are 5 8 diameter holes. I've drawn the line I want to cut along and I'm leaving a fair bit of material along the edge here because I want the integrity of the strength. And now I'll cut away a circle in here and that'll allow the dust to fall through. I cut apart a band clamp. I cut a section out of it to make this little gear clamp and you need a capacity of uh, about two inches. There's my four gear clamps mounted to the gamma lid and I made this bend here tight enough that it grips the plastic so they don't fall out. I'll also epoxy the other half of the gamma lid to the filter because I don't want to rely entirely on these mechanical fasteners. Okay, I spread it around the rim there. Just do a little twist to spread it and as I tighten these uh, clamps I'm keeping an eye that it doesn't you know shift so that's why I put one on each side before I tighten. You can't tighten these too much because the band clamp material will just bend. So here's the filter installed with uh, half of the gamma lid and here's the dustpan piece that will thread in. Same velocity as before, 4700 feet per minute. This filter has 300 square feet of material for the air to flow through and uh, it's not providing any excess restriction to the airflow. I'm now getting 7000 feet per minute. Next thing is bolt the cyclone to the lid and uh, Oneida supplies a couple of feet of this quarter inch gasket and it's got to be you know this side of the holes for the bolts because you don't want air leaking through there but then it's got to be you don't want it like this so you'll get air leaking through there so I'll see whether I can kind of snake it around if that doesn't work I will use my old reliable vanilla scented Mulco seal and peel so I managed to snake that around and you want these ends to butt up tight cut it actually a little bit long so they push together and no no air gap there I cleaned this plastic with methyl hydrate before I applied the gasket. That helps it really stick well. And with the nuts tightened down, I can see the gasket compressing, so that's good. This band is thicker at the top than the bottom. I had it upside down and I could not close it, so I figured that out. And if it doesn't close easily, spray some dry lubricant around the inside of it and on the hinges. That's what I did. This opening is six and one eighth inch. I've got six inch tubing over there. It's actually metric, uh, so it's 150 millimeter, which is a little less than six inch. I'm soaking it in the hottest tap water I could get. It's been in there a good minute or two. That is not going to make it. I put these little strips of wood in to make it like a barrel so that the band clamps can all pull it in uniformly. Put this little brace here just because it was kind of caving in there where the bolts and I've gotten it started at six and one eighth diameter. I'm down now to I don't know somewhere between five and a half and five and three quarter. So I think I'll let that cool. So that maintained the reduced diameter now five and three quarter inch OD. It was six and one eighth. I cut some of the six inch hose off but left it long enough so that the uh, lid of the drum can sit on the floor and the hose will stretch out because that's how it would be when I'm cleaning out the drum. Same story here on the air intake port is just a little too big. So I've dropped from 7100 feet per minute when I had this connected directly to the blower. Now going through the six inch hose, the cyclone and the five inch hose, I'm down to 5700 feet per minute. What's happening there is the top of the drum is buckling when the vacuum is created in the drum. It shuts off, the vacuum is released and it buckles back. Here's my solution to the lid buckling under vacuum. A piece of half inch plywood bolted to the underside of the lid. That still rocks a bit so I'll put some screws around the edges. With the addition of these 
six screws, the lid no longer buckles. And that just about fills one leaf bag. And that's how much sawdust the cyclone allowed to go through to the filter while it filled up a bin of the thicker sawdust. So the cyclone is operating very efficiently. The only critical component here is the banner level sensor. If you use a 12 volt light, then get a 12 volt adapter, of course. And the light should draw no more than 50 milliamp. I ordered this banner optical level sensor on eBay, direct from China. It's cheaper that way. Here's my implementation of that circuit. I've got a connector that goes to the level sensor, a connector that goes to the 24 volt power supply, the wiring inside. So here we are all plugged in. On the top of the banner sensor, there's a little range screw. So I'm adjusting that in order that the light comes on at about five inches. That will give me a signal when the sawdust is about five inches from the top of the bin. I don't want to go right to the top because then it would be coming up through the cyclone into the filter. And the banner level sensor is inserted into the lid. You'll notice this lid has gone rusty. It didn't come like that, but I made the mistake of storing it in my crawl space and it rusted up really quick. It's just that kind of metal. So it doesn't affect the functionality, but that's something you might want to be aware of. They provided a hole in their lid, but it's a kind of big. So I'm going to put these neoprene washers and I cut it to fit the sort of rectangular round hole of the sensor. So I'm going to put one on each side and I'm going to stick them on with this Scott extremely strong mounting tape. That cuts pretty good with scissors. Okay, let's see if this works. And I've cleaned all the surfaces with methyl hydrate. Same thing on the other side and I've stuck the banner sensor through the hole to use it as a guide so that I get the orientation and alignment of this to match the one on the other side. I don't know if the camera really shows it, but there's quite a deep profile to the sawdust here. And the flattest spot is about there, which is where the um, level sensor is located. So that gives a more predictable reading than if it's hitting on some kind of a steep angle there. Here is my air pressure meter. It's just a quarter inch plastic tube. One end goes through a hole into the box. The other end is open. So as pressure builds up in the box, it will force the colored water through here. And the number of inches it rises is the air pressure in inches of water. Now with the filter hooked up, the water went up maybe 1 16th of an inch. So the filter is allowing the air to flow through freely, which is good. After cutting a lot of wood, the bin is full and the light is flashing. And the static pressure has increased to about one eighth of an inch of water. The light is flashing again because the barrel has filled up with sawdust for the second time. And the static pressure is about five sixteenths of an inch of water. I'm cleaning the filter by spraying 50 PSI air from the outside, which is the manufacturer's recommended method. With just a light cleaning of the filter, using the air hose on the outside, I'm back to about one eighth of an inch. I thought it would be neat to have a pressure gauge instead of that tube full of water. As you can see, the pressure fluctuates, and so the needle's all over the place, which will wear out the mechanism. I guess with the tube of water, that mass of the water in the tube would dampen the vibration and give a stable reading. I stuff some cotton batten into the tube and the tighter I pack it, the more slowly the needle moves. Before I put the cotton batten in, I slipped a little piece of smaller diameter tubing down inside so that the cotton batten wouldn't work its way into the mechanism of the meter. I don't think it would anyway, but just kind of a precaution. One thing I want to mention is that I chose a meter with a one quarter inch of water full scale because I was getting about an eighth of an inch of water in that tube that I was showing earlier. However, depending where you drill the hole for the pressure to be measured, I get a different reading. And depending how far I push the tube into the box, I get a different reading. So it's not really a accurate absolute measure of pressure. It's a good relative indication of pressure. And of course that makes it a little difficult to decide what pressure meter to purchase. 
I think if I was doing it again, I would get a half inch of water full scale uh, because on this side, the meter was going right to full scale all the time. And so I think I could find a spot that would be about right with a half inch full scale. Right now, the filter is kind of moderately clean. If I did a really thorough cleaning, I'd probably get a lower pressure reading. And when it's dirty, I'll get up near full scale. So this is just kind of a general indicator of how the filter is doing and when I need to clean it. A powerful dust collection system would be to simply connect this 5 inch hose to whatever machine is being used with some kind of a quick disconnect like a mag port. But I know that I would forget to move the hose and so I need an automated system using blast gates. To switch the vacuum automatically from one machine to another, I run the 5 inch hose from the cyclone into this hollow box. Then I have blast gates that take four inch hoses to each individual machine. To cut the holes in the top of the manifold, I made templates out of three quarter inch MDF for each size of hole. This one is for the five inch port. And then I can test to make sure I got it the right size. And also, because the template is the same width as the box, I can position the template on here and then know that I've got all the holes lined up. And so I checked that the template is square to the edge here. I'm going to first cut through with a 7 16th diameter bit with a 1 half inch bearing. So that'll be slightly undersized. Then I'll finish up with a half inch bit and half inch bearing to get the exact same size hole as the template and that'll make it clean. That start a hole just makes it easier to get the router bit started. I'm cutting through in two passes halfway each time. There you can see I've not quite come into matching the template. Half inch bearing, half inch bit, final cut. Five inch port. I'll position the first gate about there. Enough room for the ducting pencil mark. And then I've got a template for the four inch ports, which I can position over the pencil mark and the line with the edges. I'm going in a clockwise direction because that forces the router bit into the edge of the template. With the gate squared up to the edge, I can then mark the holes where the screws will go later and position the next gate. So there's the top and now I know where I can cut off this material. The bottom will be the same except it won't have the 5 inch. I'm cutting off the excess that is going to be inside the manifold so that I'll get better airflow unobstructed by these things. As soon as I see the plastic start to melt, then I stop and let the blade cool down. I cut dados in the sides to receive these two pieces. And I've got four inches of clear space in between for the air to flow without obstruction because I cut off those things. If I hadn't cut those off, maybe I would have increased this to, I don't know, five and a half inches. So that's another option, but I wanted to make this as compact as possible. And then the ends have dados to match those and also uh, rabbited there to go over the, the ends like so. I'll use this removable sealant to close any gaps that air might seep through. It's made for uh, temporarily sealing around windows, you know, by putting a clear sheet on and it's designed that you can just peel it off easily. Here's a test to see how the Malco peels off wood okay, peels off plastic okay. I'll just run a small bead of this stuff around the edge there to get a good seal. And that's getting glued together. The alternative would have been screws, but I don't think I'll ever want to take this apart. Got six of these wall adapters that came with the six blast gates. And these things usually fail in a safe way, but once in a while kind of go up in a smoke and melt. It's safer to put them all in a metal box, and if that does happen, less chance of a fire. I couldn't find a power bar that would fit the metal box, so I took two ends of extension cords, cut them off, and wired that in to a single cable coming through a gland. And in addition, off of the ground, I've got a fine wire that will be for the static discharge that goes to each of the gates. So these black wires come from the AC adapters and they plug into each of the blast gates. In addition, there's a thinner green wire connected to the ground and I run that into the ground on each of these. And these loose wires on each gate will go to the flexible ducting, which has a copper wire spiraled inside of it. These red crimp stab connectors 
that come with the IVAC. They have a pretty small diameter wire hole, so I'm going to replace them with these blue ones that have a bigger hole. When the wires are positioned the way I want them, then I can slip on one of these strain relief things. You don't need this special tool, but it's sort of handy. And that protects the wires. There are the six AC adapters packed into the metal box, and there's a nice space left over to tuck in all the loose wires and the metal cover. I've numbered the blast gates according to the address that commands them to open and it's a good idea to test each one to make sure all the dip switches are set correctly. So with the sensor set to three, uh, blast gate number three opened and then when I go to off and wait 50 seconds it will close. Three short hoses connected to the bottom gates of the manifold, secured with band clamps, and the ground wire connected to the wire inside the ducting. I'll show a close-up here of the end of the wire. After I've peeled back the plastic, there's still a bit of uh, sticky goo on it, so I soldered the end of the wire to give a clear electrical connection. This cover provides some mechanical protection. It's not meant to be airtight, it's just so that stuff doesn't hit the blast gates inside. Before I go any farther, I'll do an electrical continuity check between the ground pin and the cable looks good on all three of them. And that way I know my static discharge connection to the ground is good. This is the top of the manifold box with the five inch hose from the cyclone on the right and three four inch hose coming off of the blast gates going to the tools. And with the two piece lid measuring 4,000 feet per minute at the four inch hose connected to the blast gate and it may actually be a little better in the final installation because the four inch hose will be cut shorter and the aluminum test piece will not be in place. Very short hoses can go from the manifold to the tools because they're all located in this tight island. I put a two and a half inch port on here with no blast gate and I can just slip a paint can lid over that when it's not being used and the vacuum holds it in place. I can connect a big hose for cleaning up the floor and stuff like that and I can connect a small hose for random orbit sander things like that. The suction is not as powerful as the shop vac but it's handy because it doesn't fill up the shop vac and it's enough suction that it works. I don't have a blast gate on this port and I can control it with the remote control which I've set to blast gate number eight, which doesn't exist, or I can put a um, tool sensor on the power cord of whatever tool I'm using and turn it on that way with set to blast gate number eight. I cut those holes in the floor with a router using the same template. I just enlarged the hole to match the outside diameter of the tubing and they will receive the three flexible ducts that come out the bottom of the manifold. And there's the manifold positioned under the bench with the three stubs of hoses going through the holes in the floor and connect to rigid metal piping. Here's one of the ducts that goes off towards the chop saw. Switch to flexible ducting again to go up through the floor. Here's another duct connecting to a flexible duct that goes up through the floor to the bandsaw ducting comes unassembled so you've got to work it in like a zipper starting from one end keep that end closed with one hand and then work your way along now that's 30 gauge metal it also comes in 26 gauge which I would prefer because then you can put the band clamps on tighter without it collapsing and it's just a stronger stuff but I bought a piece of the 26 gauge and it just about killed my hands trying to do that operation so if you got strong hands you can go with the 26 gauge if you got my hands you can go with the 30 gauge and then when you got it assembled you usually find it's not it's a bit out of round so you can kind of squeeze it a bit and try and shape it more round I'm soaking the end of the flexible hose in a bucket of the hottest tap water I could get, plus I poured in a kettle of boiling water. I'll let that soak for a couple minutes. 
this is the uh, fat end of the pipe. It doesn't have the taper, so it's a little harder to get on. But I'm finding this much easier than the hairdryer method. This band clamp, I'm only tightening enough that it comes down and pushes on the plastic part of the tubing, because uh, I don't want the metal to collapse. And it's almost not needed because once this plastic part um, cools, it, it shrinks and it's quite tight. Uh, then I've crimped on a ring connector and screwed that into the metal so that I continue the static discharge path. I could have done the whole installation in the flexible ducting, but the airflow is more efficient when there's a smooth wall. If it's metal ducting, then you want to tape the seams so that you don't lose air. And at the joints, tape them as well. And I put a couple of screws in so they don't wiggle apart. The airflow on this four inch hose, which is quite far from the dust collection system, is 3,600 feet per minute, a little bit low. But when it's forced through a two and a half inch pipe, it jumps up to 5,400 feet per minute, which is great for connecting to smaller ports like the router table fence, or the port on the chop saw, or the port on the sander. They'll all be getting very high velocity in excess of 5,000 feet per minute, even though they're located some distance from the dust collector. If you have this kind of segmented cutter head, then the sawdust shavings will be small and they'll flow easily through a four inch duct. But if you've got the traditional cutter heads with straight knives, then you can get fluffy, bulky shavings and they may clog up a four inch duct. So you've either got to go for a larger duct or have a system where you can easily take the ducts apart to clean them. The planer very conveniently has a couple of M8 threaded holes. So I made this custom fitted wooden box. Fits in there snug. I needed a removable cover on this box in order to access those bolts that secure it to the planer. So I made the cover out of plexiglass and that way I can see shavings coming through. This jointer didn't have any port for connecting dust collection. So I made this piece of wood with magnets on each side and it attaches firmly to the jointer. So over here at the bandsaw, which is the farthest machine from the dust collector, I'm still getting 3,600 feet per minute. This cutout here was done a long time ago so that the door could fully open without hitting the motor for changing the bandsaw blade and cleaning. And now for dust collection, I'll cut that into a circle that matches the dust port. I custom made this with uh, rare earth magnets inside. Snaps on there. And one thing I want to mention is uh, these magnets are one quarter inch diameter, one quarter inch long, rare earth magnets. I drilled the holes, put them in with epoxy, and then immediately applied it in place. And that allowed the magnets to level themselves against the uneven surface of the saw here. The usual way of connecting the tool sensor is to clamp it onto the cable of the tool. Because I have easy access to the house wiring or shop wiring, I can place my tool sensor on the wire that goes to that receptacle and then it's out of the way. And I set the sensitivity to the minimum value, which is clockwise. And the low sensitivity is important because these flat cables radiate a strong electromagnetic field. And when there's multiple cables, as shown here, uh, an unintentional cable can activate the tool sensor. So you need the sensitivity set to low so that it only picks up the cable that is clamped into it. And now the plug for the tool is free of any accessories and so it's easy to remove when the tool is being serviced. I made this box which takes a four inch hose and directs the vacuum to one of two two and a half inch ports using this slider which has a couple of super magnets epoxied into it and the lid has ultra high molecular weight tape in here to make it slippery and the ends are pinned under these little bits glued in here then I can slide like that when it's all assembled and here we are with the plastic ports installed I used brass screws here so that the magnets don't jump to them and these magnets are 3 8 diameter and I put two in each spot here as well as two in each spot on the inside so that's a total of eight magnets here's a single four inch duct feeding two devices and that goes to this selector box 
to block out one or the other of the ports. And I've got both power cords from those tools going through the same tool sensor. Even though one of them is 220 volt and the other is 120 volt, it works fine. I adjusted the sensitivity potentiometer in here so that it would work for uh, both of the tools. Then when either tool is turned on, the uh, same blast gate opens and directs the air. 